Are the New Orleans Saints now in position to recapture the golden era of their offense here in 2023? We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Huda Nation and Huda family? Welcome into another episode of Locked On Saints, your daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much as always for making Locked On Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget you can subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, I am your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, your New Orleans Saints expert, credential member of the media senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network, Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation site, covering the New Orleans Saints. You can find me Tuesdays in the Locked on NFL podcast and here with you every single Monday through Friday on Locked on Saints. And on today's episode, we have some more of your questions uh, from previous episodes. We're going to dive into what we're most excited about in 2023 and a few other questions that we'll dig into as well. But first today, our big goal is to answer the great question that came from our uh, one of our listeners um, at just to kosher Petty Murphy over on Twitter, who wants to know what are some of the real changes and tendencies from successful 2010 to 2015 offensive juggernaut era New Orleans Saints that Pete Carmichael needs to get back to here in 2023 in order for the team to maybe recapture a little bit of that golden age. And so we're going to start with the pass game, then we're going to jump to the run game. But in starting with the passing game, the thing that I want to or, or really before we get to either of those things. The thing that I want to highlight here is that we have to look at the personnel too. I mean, 2010, 2011, 2012, these were high-flying offenses because you had the Drew Breeses of the world, the Jimmy Grahams of the world, the Marcus Colstons of the world. So do the New Orleans Saints have what it takes now in terms of the roster, in terms of the personnel, in terms of the makeup, in terms of the build to be successful like they were at that time. So if we were kind of do like a little bit of a roster to roster comparison, that might give us a little bit of an idea of, okay, if this is what the roster looks like versus what that roster looks like, what can you do? What can you add? And there are some really easy ways to rebuild and sort of reachieve or reimagine, uh, recapture, if you will, that passing offense success. So obviously, if we start with the quarterback here, it's unfair because there's no, there's just simply no, um, comparison to Drew Brees available. Drew Brees is one of the best quarterbacks to ever play the game. Derek Carr is really good. He is not one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play the game, at least not yet. We'll see if he turns into that in New Orleans, but that seems like a thing that you wait and see as opposed to start trying to predict because nine times out of 10, you're going to be wrong with a prediction of that magnitude. So if we look at the quarterbacks, the thing that you really draw a conclusion here to is that now you have a quarterback that has a similar skill set as Drew Brees in that he can be the guy that calls the protections changes the plays, the line of scrimmage, that is a great pre-snap quarterback that handles pressure okay, that, um, you know, handles pressure in terms of like in-game pressure, right? You're down three and need to drive to get a field goal to tie or a touchdown and win that kind of pressure. Uh, So all of those things feel familiar. So at least they give you some of those boxes to check. I think just being able to get back to the point to where you have a quarterback who is, you know, getting two, two, um, two play calls in the huddle and then picking the play based upon what they see by the defense and calling his own protections, that's a huge step forward for the New Orleans Saints in terms of what they had over the course of the past couple of years. So quarterback to quarterback, you're not really there yet, but you're in a better position than you had been, than you have been since Drew Brees. Uh, When you come to running back, Pierre Thomas, Darren Sproles, Chris Ivory, and then of course, Mark Ingram. Well, now we're looking at guys like Alvin Kamara, Jamal Williams, and Kendra Miller, and Eno Benjamin. Not that bad in terms of what the diverse skill sets are. So that's not too terrible. You look at wide wide receiver, there's a little bit of, it kind of depends upon how you feel here, right? I mean, you've got guys like Marcus Colston. Maybe you compare that to Michael Thomas, your quintessential X receiver. You have your field stretchers and Robert Meacham, as well as Devery Henderson. Bam, you've got those guys when it comes to uh, Chris Olave and Rashid Shahid. You've got a couple of other options. But the thing that you're missing is a Lance Moore. You don't have that guy on this roster that can go and get you those tough yards from the slot. That can, you know, be deployed all over the place without necessarily being a gadget guy or anything like that. Like Lance Moore is the thing that you're still missing on this offense. That's why I keep hearkening this idea or keep bringing up this idea of like, 
trading for Hunter Renfro, even though the Saints have a good wide receiver core, until you know that you have somebody that can produce at that level out of the slot, which I don't know that we know yet for this team, you could go and find somebody to do that. Now, maybe A.T. Perry, you know, who wants to get some work in the slot, he becomes a little bit more of that. Maybe Brian Edwards can can operate there. Maybe we see one of the, the young uh, undrafted free agent wide receivers make the roster and become literally the next Lance Moore in that way. Like there's a couple of different ways that uh, that that can all uh, that that can all come about. And then finally, just in terms of looking at skill positions, you've got tight end. You had Jimmy Graham. And you think about it, and we think all the time about having multiple tight ends and stuff like that. The Saints had Jimmy Graham and John Gilmore were effectively the two tight ends that got the most snaps and appeared in the most games. Then they had guys like Michael Higgins, as well as, of course, the one and only David Thomas. But I I think when you look at where the Saints are right now, you probably still want a little bit of help at tight end. But having a big time pass catcher that can stretch the field and attack the seams like Juwan Johnson gets you at least a step closer. So personnel has to be a big part of this conversation, but what do you need to do in the in the passing game to kind of recapture a little bit of what we saw back in 2011 or 2012, 2013, whatever? I think a big part of it is getting back to an offense that challenges all three levels and that stretches you horizontally as well as vertically. I think that's a big part of what the Saints haven't had here recently. We've seen a, an offense that's very condensed, that's trying to operate low to high, And I think the principle of operating low to high is still one that makes a ton of sense for New Orleans. That's just the West Coast part of the West Coast slash or Air Coriel blend that they do over on the offensive side. But I do think that a little bit more dynamic can help for this team. And that's where Derek Carr really gives you your next kind of level because you didn't necessarily have that. Derek Carr was a guy or you look at like Andy Dalton. Andy Dalton was a guy that could push the ball downfield, but didn't like to do it very often, but was great when it came to like picking apart, you know, short intermediate areas, more so short areas. Um, Jameis Winston was a guy that could get the ball downfield consistently for you, no problem, but struggled in the short area of the game. Derek Carr is a guy that can do both. He can do both. He's not going to be, you know, Josh Allen down the field, but he's going to be Drew Brees down the field. I mean, he can get to that level. He doesn't have to be exactly Drew Brees down the field. You know what I mean? But the frequency at which they were comfortable throwing downfield with Drew Brees You can be comfortable with that same frequency with Derek Carr. That's what I mean. And so your ability to be able to attack deep, but also have a quarterback that knows to dump off to the running back, that uses the screen patterns, that's able to to dice stuff up underneath, that's able to get mixy in sort of the intermediate levels. Like having a dynamic offense that allows you to be able to do that is great. And then having a deep offense that not only, a deep attack offense that not only attacks the far outsides, the perimeters, but that attacks the middle of the field, that attacks the seams. That allows you to stretch things horizontally across the field as well. Those are the things that made the New Orleans Saints 2011 offense so special and so unpredictable. You can come in and pick up 60 yards on a screen pass. You can come in, you can pick up 60 yards down the seam. You can come in, you can pick up 60 yards in a catch and run. You can come in, you can pick up six, uh, 60 yards down the sideline. There are so many ways that this offense was able to attack you in all three levels of the field, all across the zones of the field. So if the Saints can get back to that, then they have a real opportunity, especially with Derek Carr at the helm and with the weapons that they do have. I think you still need to find your Lance more, which is going to be really hard to do because Lance is one of the best to ever do it. You put them, you know, you find those guys, you have the right guys to get it done, but now you just need Pete Carmichael in a position. He even said on WWO Radio not too long ago, he said, I've got to get better. We need swaggy P. We need Pete the Drip Carmichael, cigarette backwards, hat, sunglasses, like that's who we need. That's who you need to be seeing over on that sideline. And if he's able to be that guy and attack all three levels and attack all across the field to where you're turning the field into 12 different areas or, or, or four, 16 different areas that you're attacking, then all of a sudden it's a game changer for your team because no defense knows what to expect when an offense is able to attack anywhere on the field. And that's what made, in terms of the passing game, things so special for that era of New Orleans Saints offense. What made the run game special? Well, the Saints may actually be ready to, may actually be in process of rebuilding it and may be ready to revisit it sooner rather than later. We got that coming up for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by our friends over at Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar on the planet in the universe, in the known observable human history. You cannot find a better protein bar than Built Bar. Listen to some of these flavors. 
salted caramel, cookies and cream. You've got coconut almond. You've got coconut brownie. You've got cookie dough. There's so much cool stuff, including my favorite, mint brownie. And every one of those flavors is also covered in 100% chocolate. And I know what you're thinking. Whoa, Ross doesn't sound like a protein bar. It sounds like a candy bar. Well, it tastes like a candy bar too, but it is a protein bar. We're talking 17, 18 grams of protein, but only about 130 grams of 130 calories or about four or five grams of sugar. Like it's that dope. So make sure you go check it out. You can find them today at built.com. So you can check out the entire collection. Or if you're near a Walmart or a Sam's Club, they got you covered too. Walmart pharmacy section, four boxes of some great flavors. You can head over to Sam's Club as well. Get that Baker's Dozen 13 bar box of some hit flavors like churro puff, as well as brownie batter puff as well. Once again, at Sam's Club, Walmart and built.com for the best tasty protein bars on the market. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Make sure you come through every day for another episode on a Monday. We'll be right back at it, taking a deeper look at the New Orleans Saints entire offseason. And then we're going to go back. One of the things I want to do, like we spend so much time kind of grading the draft right after it happens, but we very, really, very rarely revisit drafts to grade them. So I'd like to go back and regrade the last three years of drafts. That's going to take a little bit of research on my end. I'm going to pick up some grades from after, you know, from other outlets, like right after those drafts and then kind of see where things uh, have come about. Uh, Yes, we will discuss the 2020 draft (laughs) and everything. And so we'll look at some of the previous drafts and kind of figure out like where, you know, some of these these things are versus where they start, because uh, look, a lot changes in a couple of years. So we're going to be going through that throughout the week uh, as well. So appreciate you as always making us your first listen of the day every day and for the everydayers out there catching the show. All right, so let's get uh, into the run game portion of our conversation around the New Orleans Saints recapturing their golden era of uh, offensive football. Thanks to uh, Petty Murphy at Just Too Kosher on Twitter for the, the great question here. So looking at the, the run game and this kind of I'm going to try to tie the passing game and run game together here to start. As we were discussing kind of the three level threat and then the 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 horizontal threat for the New Orleans Saints offense and where it's got to be able to go. I'm going to readjust that a little bit. I'm going to call it a four level threat because when we talk about three level threat, we're usually saying short, intermediate, long, right? And so short would be zero to 10 yards. Intermediate would be 10 to 20 yards. Deep would be 20 to more yards downfield. But the fact of the matter is that you also want to be able to attack well behind the line of scrimmage. Screen passes, uh, jet sweep, shovel passes, uh, Y leaks, uh, you know, split zone action, stuff like that. Split zone action is the one where you, once the play starts post snap, the tight end comes across the formation behind the offensive line and the quarterback can dump it off there as they're working horizontally, laterally to the line, to the, uh, to the sideline. And so if you're able to attack in all of those four areas of the field, then your run game benefits from that as well. And your run game, I kind of, include as a part of the behind the line of scrimmage attack. So the run game blends in with that. And then the short passing game in terms of screen passes, dump offs, flats, things like that. Those are kind of extensions of your run game at the same time. So I think that that's another place where the Saints have to get back to being able to produce. And again, having a quarterback who can just as efficiently throw beyond the line of scrimmage is fine and not going to ignore what's going on behind the line of scrimmage. That will help you a, 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 quite a bit getting there. The other thing that it helps you out with a lot too is play action. And that's something that we haven't seen until we saw it. We didn't see a lot of screens last year for the Saints. And we didn't see a lot of play action. Um, we saw it a little bit with, with Andy Dalton. He was pretty efficient there, over 70% completion percentage when he was asked to do that. Jameis did it early on in the season. And we saw what happened like in that 11 personnel attack in the fourth quarter of that Atlanta Falcons game and what that could have been. That's pretty accustomed to what we're used to seeing from a New Orleans Saints offense, running out of 11 personnel, passing out of 11 personnel. But then the Saints dealt with so many injuries and things like that, that they had to go to a lot of 12 personnel afterwards. It didn't used to be necessarily the MO of the New Orleans Saints. They were fine with two tight ends on the field, but oftentimes you just saw one tight end, one running back, and then you had guys like Henderson, Meacham, and Colston all on the field. Now you could see something like that with Thomas, Olave, uh, Shahid, or um, Perry, Alave, Shahid, if, if Michael Thomas deals with more injuries and things like that. So the, the Saints have a lot more that they could do there. Now, Ross, what, what does this all have to do with the, with the run game? Okay. So if the passing game is efficient, the run game can be efficient too, because then you can go out there and you're, you're, you're stretching the defense horizontally with your passing sets when you come out there in 11 personnel. So they come out in a lighter sort of nickel 
defense with an extra defensive back, one less linebacker on the field, and they're not filling the box. And so the box is like five to seven yards up from the line of scrimmage and then between the tackles, right? So when you're looking at, or, or you could really go between the tight ends if you were to kind of extend it out a little bit. So when you look at where they would be able to attack that way with the run game, if you're really light in the box and you've only got seven or six there, four down linemen and two linebackers, then ready to run the ball all day. Wash the hands of it like Birdman, like we're good. And so I think that that's the next piece that that you would look for when it came to being able to benefit your, your run game is how good the passing game is and how much it forces defenses to be light on defense because of the threat that your passing game um, present. So they go with less weight, more speed. And then that gives you an opportunity to be able to attack a little bit more with your run game. Then because of that and that working, it creates the, you know, ever growing efficiency of the back and forth between the play action passes as well. It's where when you run those play action passes, those linebackers or those safeties creep up and then bam, you're in over the top of those players in the intermediate or deep areas of the field. So you see how the two can complement one another. That's a big part of what you're looking for is sort of that complementary style. Speaking of complementary style, more running back by committee, please. Pierre Thomas, uh, 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 Mark Ingram, Chris Ivory, uh, uh, Darren Sproles, those guys all getting mixed in with one another and Jed Collins at fullback, like them moving around all over the place and being on the field in some cases and not other cases, but not really knowing that just because this back's on the field that they're going to do this, right? The telegraph that could be there. The Saints can get back to that this year and they're maybe a little bit closer than we realize. I mean, we're sitting here speaking so much about, oh, Alvin Kamara, and Jamal Williams and Kendra Miller, where does a guy like, you know, Benjamin fit in? Well, maybe they all fit in. Like, maybe there's some real stuff there. And I had somebody ask me the other day, and this is another thing we'll get to next week that you're definitely not going to want to miss, is what would it look like if the Saints did trade Alvin Kamara away uh, with all the legal stuff going on and, and everything? What could, what, what could that look like? We'll look at that. But if that doesn't happen, that sort of quad attack of, of, of running backs is very diverse in terms of their skill set, but they also have a lot of overlapping skills that I think benefit the offense in terms of not telegraphing what they're going to do when a certain player is on the field. So I do think that mixing those guys in and around, being able to attack not only between the tackles, but use the, your running game around the perimeter, get these players out in space in the passing game as well, so that it's not telegraphed that, oh, this player's on the field, therefore it's a run, this player's on the field, therefore it's a pass. You get sort of all of the um, mix and match in there. You confuse the defense. You give them a lot of options, all that. So those are the things that I think would help to revitalize the New Orleans Saints run game. And of course, all of that feeds right back into the passing game as well and vice versa. The passing game being revitalized like really, really kind of seeps in and, and, and permeates that success to the run game uh, too. So I think four-level attack in the passing game that gets you all across the field, seam, perimeter, middle of the field, all of that. And then a run game that uses a little bit more zone run, um, gets that offensive line moving up to the second level, gets some of those lead blockers, things like that, but also a diverse run set that includes a lot of different players rotating, a little bit more of a committee approach. And then, of course, those guys being used in the passing game helps make all the difference as well. I think you get those things right, then all of a sudden you're back into the tenets of a New Orleans Saints offense the way that we're accustomed to seeing it as a high-flying, high-octane offense as opposed to what we've seen over the course of the past couple of years. Coming up next, what is the thing that we're most excited about in 2023? Is it a potential trip to Germany or is it something else? We're going to get into that as we continue on and get to all of your questions as well as we wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it. Huda Nation wrapping up today's episode of Locked on Saints with your questions from the Locked on Saints multiverse, which is what we're calling when you submit through whether it's YouTube, YouTube chat during the live shows, whether you're sending it through Twitter DMs or Twitter on Twitter, the Locked on Saints Facebook group. We got it all. So we're going to start off here. April Cage at April underscore Cage on Twitter. Ask a, a question that seems simple, but really is is an exciting and kind of interesting premise. What are you most excited about for this season? And there's a lot that I'm excited about when it comes to covering this 2023 New Orleans Saints season. I think that the defensive line is going to be a ton of fun to watch. Could we finally see the Saints have a premier edge rusher opposite Cam Jordan, along with Cam Jordan being a premier edge rusher himself? Is that finally the case? Um, could we see a whole new style of running back with Kendra Miller, depending upon how that room shakes out, what happens with Alvin Kamara, all that. This is a potential trip to Germany, um, apparently. Uh, the Saints might be doing back-to-back -back international trips, which would be kind of wild. 
Uh, but I think that there's a lot to be to be excited about. But I'll tell you, I think the thing I'm most excited about is really just being back at it and in, in, in training camp. Like training camp to me is some of the most fun because it's it's so hopeful. It's such a positive environment. Like it's all those things, and the, you know you love it. Like all that. Like I think that's some of the stuff that I think is is the most fun. Now that we're through what I what I'm always most excited about, which is the NFL draft. That I think the next thing that I'm most excited about is definitely going to be training camp because. There's a lot to watch during training camp. Who's going to win the cornerback spot opposite Marshawn Lattimore? Will that be Elante Taylor or will that be Paul Sandivo? Will somebody uh, cross-train into the slot and compete with Bradley Roby there? Is Bradley Roby going to get moved? Will some other player get moved uh, at some point? Um, you know, Do Brian Brzee and Isaiah Foskey show up during training camp to such a point to where they're getting early starts in 2021 or 2023? Who is A.T. Perry as a player in this system? Like, who is Derek Carr as a player in this system? I think there's so much of that that we'll get our early glimpses at during training camp. And we get to see the dynamicism of what a fully, you know, uh, a full training camp does for a guy like Rishi Shahid. We'll see what a second year does for a guy like Chris Olave. Is Michael Thomas back? Is he healthy? Can he stay on the field? Like, all of those questions we'll start to answer throughout training camp. And I think that's going to be. Um, a ton of fun. So training camp is probably the thing that I'm most looking forward to up next here in 2023. Um, next, we'll go to uh, Bionic Brass Band who asks, is there a reasonable path for the New Orleans Saints acquiring Chase Young, the veteran edge rusher out of Washington? Uh, and when could we see a real, uh, when can we see the Saints realistically working to get uh, Yannick Ngakwe? Well, I think no matter what, like they're realistically working at trying to figure stuff out like right away. Um, and everything and, and, and adding, you know, more talent and stuff like that. So I think the the answer to like, when will we see that happening is probably now. Uh, but is there a realistic shot that they go after and pursue Chase Young? I think it depends on what the asking price is. I've seen a lot of people throw around, well, it's got to be at least a first round pick because he's an edge rusher. I, I don't think so. Like, I would be surprised if his value is anything more than a couple of round four couple, you know, around three selection, something like that. I'd be surprised. He's been injured. He hasn't been productive, um, you know, since that rookie year. Uh, you know, there's just not really a lot going for him, particularly as of late. And we have to remember the NFL is not, what have you done for me? What have you done for me in the recent past? It is, what have you done for me lately, right? It, it, or in the distant past, it's, what have you done for me lately? And so when you ask the question, like, what has Chase Young done for the Washington commanders lately? The answer is, not great, especially when you've got a guy like Montez Sweat over on the opposite side that has been playing very well. And so if there's a shot here to where a team like the commander says, okay, well, we're ready to deal out Chase Young because he's not, he's been disappointing, right? They're not dealing him because he's a fantastic player. That's not how NFL trades work. They're dealing him because they don't want him anymore. And so if that's the case, what is his value then? And so if the team is coming out there saying, yeah, okay, we're going to trade this player, which clearly says that they don't like the player anymore, they don't feel that the player fits anymore, then they can't come out asking for a first or a second round pick. It doesn't work that way. And so instead, it's got to be something like those day three selections. So I think, look, if you can get them for a couple of day three selections, sure, like, why not? I guess you could try it. But I'm, I'm good, honestly, on, on the Chase Young front. I think you go out, you grab a veteran proven pass rusher that maybe is like, a, a year past their prime or something. And you just bring that person in to be a mentor and you bring that person in to be a backup. Like that's what you're going for here because you've got Isaiah Foskey, you've got Carl Granderson, you've got Tonal Pass and you know, we'll see who Peyton Turner is. And of course you've already got Cameron Jordan. If you want to add somebody to that room, add a proven veteran to that room, add, an, add some experience to that room, not somebody that's been on a downslide ever since that they, you know, finished up their rookie season. I, I just don't see the point in giving up assets for a guy like who Chase Young has turned out to be as of late and would lead the team to, that drafted him as highly as they did to trading him away. One thing, if you're grabbing him, out, uh, grabbing him in free agency, like Kevin White, like the Kevin Whites and, and, and Jameis Winston's the world, entirely different situation when they're like, we don't like this person, now give us a bunch of stuff for him. Uh, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't make any sense to me. So I, I, I stay away from that uh, altogether. I'm really picky about trades, I'm, I'm learning, because there are people who are like, oh yeah, trade for Patrick Queen and trade for Devin White and trade for... You know, Chase Young and all that stuff. And I'm like, no, trade for Hunter Renfro. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. I, I, maybe, maybe, my, uh, maybe my, my view on trades needs a little bit of, a, of an adjustment. Uh, finally, we'll get to uh, our final question here. Uh, this one is, 
Uh, do you feel that the Saints will continue with the same strategy of play calling or will they let Coach Curry call offensive plays this year as coming from American Patriots? So uh, I look at this and, and we already know the answer to this, right? Pete Carmichael's the play caller in 2023. That's already been said. That's already been reported, things like that. So I don't think we're going to see, and we asked Ronald Curry this question at the senior bowl, do you think that you'll be play? Do you think that you'll be in a role to where you're calling plays? He said, maybe I'll call a second preseason game. Last year, he called the, he called one. This year, he could call a, a second preseason game. But you certainly won't see him calling plays during the season, at least not to start, right? If the Saints get desperate at on the offensive play calling side and maybe things aren't going great, they might change play callers. But that's usually not a good sign uh, for a team. And uh, gave us a, a bonus question here. Do you think that Carr can get the Saints back to having a coach on the field like the good old days uh, with Breeze? call adjustments, things like that as needed. So actually, funny, I, I, I didn't realize it, but I actually mentioned this earlier in the show. So I kind of spoiled this one a little bit, and this is supposed to be the last question, so my bad. But whatever. Um, yes, I think Derek Carr gets you back to that, to something similar to that, right? I, I, again, I'm never going to say that Derek Carr brings you Drew Brees or Derek Carr is Drew Brees incarnate. Like, we know that that's not the case. But Derek Carr is somebody that can call protections, that can... Uh, adjust plays at the line of scrimmage. Derek Carr is the type of person to where you can give him two play calls. Uh, you can give him a full play call and then a kill call, and he can go in. He'll call both of those plays at the uh, in the huddle, and then he'll go up to the line of scrimmage, look at the look, and then be able to decide if he sticks with the play or if he changes the kill play. And so what will happen is that, in case you don't know this, if you hear it, sometimes you'll hear it on on you know the television broadcast, you hear them come up to the field, you hear them come up to center, and they'll yell, kill, 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 kill. And what that means is that they're actually going with the second play that was called in the huddle instead of the first play that was called in the huddle. So there's a there's one play that's called, and then there's a kill, this play, right? And I don't know what the I'm not going to go through because the play names are long as 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 all you know whatever when it comes to the New Orleans Saints and West Coast offenses. But if they come through and they call this play, and then they say kill this play, if they get up to the line of scrimmage and then don't say anything except for the snap count then they're running the first play. But if they go up to there and before they actually run the snap count, you hear kill, 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 kill. He's telling everybody we're going to the second play that I called in the huddle. Derek Carr brings that back to you, brings that element back to you. We didn't see a lot of changing of plays at the line of scrimmage over the course of the past couple of years, post your breeze. I think we saw it maybe a couple of times with Andy Dalton, saw it maybe a couple of times with Jameis Winston, but we didn't see it a ton. And so um, I, I think that Derek Carr brings you that person. And the Saints ran into a ton of trouble last year with Jameis Winston and Andy Dalton not being able to call protections and having instead the center do these protections and things like that, which just isn't the way that the Saints offense tends to work. And now that goes back to being the quarterback 100% of the time that's calling those protections. And then the center is helping in other ways. Um, so I think that that's great, especially when you have a guy who's been an Ironman at quarterback and you're dealing with injuries on the offensive line. If you lose that center and then a new center has to come in and then make those, those protection calls, it's entirely different. The cadence changes, the, the checks change, like you could get things wrong, all the other stuff. Um, if, if somebody who is the prime, who that's, who has that primary responsibility is the constant person doing that, then that's great. And that's kind of who Derek Carr is. So I think that that's where you get a lot of value uh, with Derek Carr and giving you sort of that coach on the field situation. Uh, Saints had so much trouble identifying blitzes, particularly on the inside last year. That should come to an end this year. All right, coming up on Monday, we are going to be taking a look at uh, some more of the undrafted free agents and everything, but we're also going to start going back and grading previous draft classes. We'll take a look at what happens if the Saints were to trade Alvin Kamara. What could that look like? We'll get to all of that here next week. So I appreciate y'all very much. If you're out at Jazz Fest, please have a fun and safe weekend. Appreciate you very much, of course, for being here. As always, if you see me say hi, shout out to Nick, who said hi yesterday. Appreciate you, homie. And uh, I appreciate all y'all, as always, for making Locked on Saints a part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, say hi. And if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you, that nation. I'll holla at you.